Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Welcome to the uh, Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, ARCUS, where Arctic research is connected since 1988. My name is Bob Rich, and I'm the Executive Director, and thank you to coming to our 24th Arctic Research Seminar Series presentation and our first Arctic Indigenous Scholars Seminar Series presentation here in Washington, D.C., where I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Teresa Aragak john ARCUS connects Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, and collaboration, providing the essential, intangible infrastructure required for research to advance. We're a not-for-profit consortium working together to promote exploration and understanding of the Arctic. Whether you're here or online, we invite each of you to become an ARCUS member. All types of organizations are eligible to become members, including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm about the importance of Arctic knowledge and research can become an ARCUS member as well. I invite each of you to join us. You can find out more on www.arcus.org. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to a wide range of leading Arctic researchers and leaders for federal officials, members of the DC policy community, and the broader public interested in the changing Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we're learning and exploring up north, and also what it means for the US and the rest of the world. This seminar is also part of the new ARCUS program um, in collaboration with the Inuit Circumpolar Council, uh, which is called Empowering Arctic Indigenous Scholarship and Making Connections. For this program, we define a scholar as a person who's an expert within their own knowledge system. No formal education is required. Teresa was selected for the excellence of her scholarship by a distinguished committee and over the course of the next few days, she'll be holding conversations and meetings with senior policymakers and decision makers around DC. Rosemary Atuangaruk is also participating in this program, but unfortunately, she was delayed by more than 24 hours getting out of her home village of New Ixit, so she's currently airborne and not able to speak with us today. We are going to schedule an opportunity for a, a webinar featuring Rosemary's scholarship at a future date, so stay tuned for that. If you're in the room, you should have received a seminar evaluation, which we'd like you to return to the registration desk at the conclusion of the seminar. Online, please fill out the survey, which will appear at the end of the seminar on your screen. We're currently planning upcoming seminars and always need your suggestions to select the best possible speakers. For those of you on Twitter, we encourage you to use the hashtag ArcusWebinar to discuss the event. We're currently joined by more than 120 registered participants in at least 14 U.S. states and in Canada, Finland, and Russia. For those of you on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions that you have about ARCUS or Arctic research and to forward to us here in D.C. any questions for Teresa. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing your questions in the chat pane of your attendee control panel. You can send in your questions at any time. Uh, during the presentation. We'll collect these and try to address them during the discussion at the end. I'd like to acknowledge our partners in this seminar series, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space. Um, and also, I uh, want to give a special thank you to the National Science Foundation's Division of Polar Programs for major financial support that's enabled Teresa to travel and be with us today, as well as this overall seminar series. Now, let me introduce our speaker. Her uh, full bio is online. Teresa Arvgok John is Associate Professor in the Department of Cross-Cultural Studies at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. She serves on the National Advisory Council on Indian Education and the International Indigenous Women's Forum. She received the Governor's Distinguished Humanities Educator Award and the Alaska State Library Award. Dr. John holds a BS, MED, and PhD from the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Please join me in welcoming to the ARCUS DC Arctic Research Seminar Series and the Empowering Indigenous Scholars Seminar Series, Teresa Arvgak John, to tell us about cultural resiliency and adaptation in Arctic climate change. Yeah. I am humbled to be here with you today. Uh, my Yupik name is Tris Arvgak, and English given name is Trisa John uh, from Tuksuk Bay. And um, my father is the, was the chief of uh, Association of Village Council President who served like 60 villages. And when I was born, um, I was born into a community that spoke only Yuktun, no English whatsoever. 
and I uh, observed the first school being built in 1960 in my community. And the only um, outsiders we saw were the local priests uh, that looked different from all the other Native people. So I was born um, into a community that was full of um, uh, traditional culture. We ate out of the land, and we still do today. Um, our first language is Yuchtun, so I'm exposed to second language um, as of um, 50 years ago, which is English. And um, so I am very humbled to be here with you today. And um, I was born into a community of where the elders taught all the children all the traditional knowledge system, indigenous ways of knowing. And uh, currently, I reside um, in my current position since 80s um, as a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, I've been in different departments, Alaska Native Studies Department, Alaska Department of Rural Development, uh, and now currently in a graduate program, uh, Center for Cross-Cultural Studies, where my focus area is on indigenous knowledge systems. And um, in my profession, I uh, teach students from all over the world. It, it's a field program, so we have students calling in from Guam, from New Zealand, from Canada, from uh, Greenland. So this opportunity has allowed us to expose our, our program uh, and offer to students from all over the world. And so we are very uh, much used to this kind of teaching. Uh, conference setting so if you're interested in applying to our program get a hold of me <laughs> and so today um, the title of my presentation um, cultural resiliency and adaptation in the Arctic climate change uh, Alaska is going through a whole bunch of change um, and I will talk about resilience uh, that encompasses continue community wellness, holistic education, effective leadership, and sustains our way of life. Cultural resilience has always been a focus of our prominent elders, ancestors, and our overall leadership. Our resilience in modern life can be supported by decolonizing and indigenizing the state and federal educational systems that protect our heritage language, indigenous knowledge system, cultural epistemic principles and values, prosperity of the people, and the well-being of the future leaders. And my state, fortunately, the state of Alaska has adopted the um, Alaska's culturally uh, standard-based relevant curriculum um, into the classroom. And so ever since I became aware of life in 50s, um, the, the ecology, the environment has changed a lot. Uh, as I said earlier, our ancestors truly embedded in us to understand life to be holistic. Holistic in the interconnectedness of the human, the land, and the spiritual realm. So what does that mean? We believe that um, everything has a spirit. Um, the air that we breathe has a spirit. The, the, um, the sky has a spirit. And anything that has a spirit requires respect. And so we believe that our food, everything we eat and drink has a spirit. So when we come from a culture that believes in that level of spirituality, that deems a lot of respect. So in our culture, we believe that humans and non-humans equally require respect. <clears throat> and when you think of that perspective, it's that whole web, that, the united web, that we see, view to be very critical. So we believe that the food that we eat uh, bring themselves to us because we show respect to them. 
Um, our climate has changed drastically. When I was growing up, there was no electricity. There was no school. There were no airplanes. We had a boat. We had seal oil lamps. That's what I was born into. <clears throat> and my parents and grandparents, sorry, thank you, um, embedded in us that we have to show respect to everything that is living and alive. And so when we think of how we view the world in a holistic perspective, it becomes important who we deal with and how we deal with life in general. And so when our ancestors say, Samyo, the creator, provided us, carefully selected us as important beings of this society, of this global world, of this humanity, we begin to understand that we need to, first of all, respect one another that has a spirit. So our language has a spirit, our mind has a spirit, our heart has a spirit. Anything that makes us alive has a spirit. So we show respect to the air we breathe. We don't trash the water. We clean the areas of the animal after we get them to show respect to that. And our climate, since it has changed, it is drastically making us think a lot. We just lost two people due to thin ice this year. I'm sorry, I have a cold coming, so excuse me, but I'll try my best. So one was 19 years old, we lost two months ago. And one was like 40 years old, we lost about 12 months ago. That is a lot of loss due to climate change. They were traveling on the ice, fell through the ice never to be found, never have been found at birth. We're still looking, we never give up, right? And so, because of the climate change, our way of thinking, our way of living is transforming as well. The food that we eat is changing. The ice is melting really fast. This year alone, we had no ice by December in front of our island. And the marine mammals are losing their land because there is no more ice out there. There's about 1,000 walrus right now on our island. That has never happened before, ever in the history of our culture. They have no more land to live on out in the ocean. There's no more ice. And the, and the moose are migrating to the coastland. They're running across the ocean. That has never happened before, thousands of them. Normally, their original land is on the mainland, in the interior. They're migrating down south. And our hunters have to adapt and adjust to these changes and the harvesters as well. Life is changing very drastically. So how do we deal with that? How do we protect our hunters? How do we protect our future leaders? We have to do that by education. We have to start working together as humanity, the scientists, the local people, from local to statewide to national to international. That is very, very important. We are in an emergency situation right now because we have to learn to work together to protect our people, to deal with these changes that the ecology is bringing, that the environment is bringing, that the climate is bringing to our table. And in order to do that, we have to listen and talk together. 
We have to have an open dialogue now. It is good to think about collaborative work. Collaborative work in terms of Western science, in terms of traditional knowledge system, traditional ecological knowledge system. That means that we have to work together to put everything on the table that is important today. Our language is dying. We need to protect our language. That's an avenue that we have to our elders, to our ancestors. Earlier I said, I watched the first school being built. That's not too long ago. My parents were born in that house, no light. They had sea loyal lamp. I watched the first generator being brought in by my dad to the community. We put wires from house to house. I watched the first telephone being Im implemented in that in that in the community. I went to a boarding school at seventh grade. No communication, no nothing with my parents for nine months. Because there was no radio system, there was no writing system, there was no communication system. That's not too long ago. It was a difficult task, past, but we are survivors because we come from resilient cultures. We adapt and adjust. And we could work together in those realms, in the Arctic and with uh, the different agencies. That's the beauty of this world today. We have technology. We have access. We can work together. We have equipment. We can talk together. I think that's what my ancestors would have encouraged us to do, is to share what we know with the new people we're dealing with. And even though scholarship is, has been there forever, the new element of scholarship is that we can learn to work together to blend different ways of knowing together from Western science to traditional science. And that can also apply to classroom context as well. I think cultural resiliency also applies to different disciplines in our lives, in education, in ecology, in science, in, in environment, in climate. And I think that's what our ancestral people were very good at understanding, that our, everything that we know to be real is intact. Nothing is separate, it's whole. It's a holistic perspective. You can't, you can't take away the science from this. You can't take away the language from this web. You can't take away the, the social science element or education. It's all one. It's one unbreakable intact. And I think that's the beauty of our cultures in, in the Arctic that they teach us everything to, so we can understand, so we can prosper in life. We come from harsh environment. We live in an environment that can be minus 80 degrees out for months, out in the ocean. Our men can be out there for 12 to 20 hours. They can survive in the storm. They can survive and tell their stories. They can come home after being out there in the blizzard and in the storm and be able to tell us what happened out there. The narratives that we have are real and they can be used as documents. They can be used as real evidence of who we are, where we come from, and how we perceive our world to be. My grandmother, when she realized that I was learning a new language, she said, go out there and as learn as much as you can about how they think, about how they perceive their world to be. So you can come back and tell us the stories of who these new people are. And when we learn about them, we can design mechanisms to live in harmony and peace. I think that's the beauty of our people. She was far in advance from her time. Here she was born in Azad house. She was a midwife. She was, she was a wife of a chief, 
the mother of a chief, you know, and you know, our people, they're willing to help, they're willing to share, they're willing to, to, to be involved in something that will benefit all humanity. That's the beauty of our people. We believe in one humanity. My late father would say, we are here today in this room and online for a purpose and a reason. And that purpose and a reason is to learn, to listen and learn and work together and collaborate together. That's what I was taught. That's how I was taught. So whenever I meet new people, I want to learn how they think, how they eat, how they smell, how their food tastes. Isn't that beautiful thing when I go to Europe or Russia? I love that about them. I remember those smells. I remember the taste of their food. I remember being with different people. I think that's the beauty of our humanity, that we are one humanity. My father would say, the only thing that makes us different is what's in our brain and in our heart. Otherwise, we're all the same. Our color doesn't matter, our eyes don't matter, our language doesn't matter. How we think matters, how we have in our heart matters. I think, you know, when the Creator created us to be part of this humanity, that was the resiliency. That we were carefully chosen and selected to be here today breathe together in this room and listen together online because we're called by the Creator to learn something and to do something about it. To me, that's beautiful. To me, that's working. The real human responsibilities that we are gifted. Our ancestors come from very strong backgrounds. My great-grandparents were able to travel through space to future and come back. My other grandfather was able to go to the spirit world and come back. That's only three generations ago. And they have stories to tell. They have narratives of their experiences. And we believe them because they're part of our life, right? That's the kind of resiliency, cultural re resiliency I come from in the Arctic, a place where animals and humans reside together and they have relationship together with the environment, with the wind, with the current, and with space. And when you think about that, when we walk out of this building, and we smell that air, and we feel that breeze. That's part of reality. That's part of reality that reminds us that we're all human, that we were built equally, that we come from resilient cultures that have powerful ancestry historical accounts that remind us that we have a lot to talk about, that we have a lot to share, that we have a lot of opportunity to collaborate and have mutual understanding and respect in all of the above. In research, when I teach students about research, how to prepare their abstract, how to prepare their, uh, their, their theoretical framework and their methodology, I remind them to lower themselves down to a point of being able to be on the same table with indigenous communities, to be in the same table and have a common language to talk, to use. Because when you use scientific terminology, you lose people. You don't want to do that. You want to sit on a table and use a common language that everyone can understand, that everyone can hear, internalize, process, analyze, and say, oh, okay, I understand that you want to 
um, um, study about how uh, what we eat affect our way of living, our health, our mind. I'll help with you on that because I understand what you want, what you need. And also to think about that um, reciprocity. Reciprocity in the sense that both sides will benefit. Scholars will benefit, communities will benefit. I think that's the best method of research. When there's a plan that everybody will benefit, benefit in a manner that when something is conducted in a collaborative framework, in the same language, so we all know what we're talking about, we all know what the plan is, and also understand the calendar year. Calendar year is very critical. When you go to the Arctic, you don't want to be there during whaling season when you want to interview local people because they're not going to have time for you. When you go to Southwest Alaska, you want to avoid the height of their subsistence life, which is like right now. Calendar years are critical. When you want full participation, planning has to be in place in advance. Planning should also involve tribal organizations because tribal organizations have the access to the local, um, their local people. They can identify good researchers for you. They can identify good translators for you. They can identify good hunters for you, good harvesters, or the right, I should say. Because there's always wannabes everywhere, right? We all know that. So you want to hit the right people. So I advise you to work with tribal people first. Tribal people will direct you to the right people. And when I do research, even in my own community, I give them like years in advance. I say, I am interested in doing this messenger festival thing. I want you to start thinking of how you can help me, of who we, I can work with how we can work together. So year after, hmm, I'm going to make the plan now. Who, would, who should I meet with? So that, that's good kind of planning. A planning that will inform, inform everyone involved or prospective participants. And view them as participants, not as, you know, you, you're going to be my whatever, victim, I don't know. <laughs> There's been so much research in the Arctic. We're researched out. Researched out. The past has good things and the past can change to improve. And past has some bad things as well. You know, in the past when there was no respect, no ethics, no principles, people just came in, videoed us, taped us, disappeared. Years later, we find these books about us. They wrote about us. That's a bad, bad research style, bad, bad research method. The best practice is to have a communal participation, communal planning, and also to uh, verify, articulate together. Living this earth with us. At one point, we thought we were the only people on earth. <laughs> Because there's no gold, there's no uh, natural resources on our island. Everybody bypassed us for a long time. So I learned to read about fifth grade. Because English was really, really hard for me. Because Yuchtun was my first language. And Yuchtun is something that I heard every single day. Narratives. and <laughs> The old narratives are pre-contact time, a time when humans and non-human beings were able to merge together, half human, half animal. Humans can travel in space. That's reality for us in our narratives, old narratives. In the contemporary narratives, those are personal accounts of our great-grandparents, of our ancestors, what they did in this time. After the crust of the earth got thicker, 
in pre-narrative time, the crust of the earth was very thin. In our perspective, in our philosophy, in our way of thinking, in our way of knowing, that's when humans and animals can fly together and go to the moon and go somewhere else, and they can communicate. That's our history. That's what we know our world to be. And when crest of the earth appeared, they say after the white people come, it was predicted the crust of the earth would become thick, and that's what happened. That's what our ancestors foretold to us. And this is what we know to be real today, that the earth is thick now. The crust of the earth is thick now. But then it's also supposed to thin again. Um, I know that that's kind of like um, maybe hard for you to understand, but that's who I am, where I come from, and what I know to be real. Our cultural values and principles, our epistemic values, are very critical because they help us to understand, understand and define um, the right way of thinking and the wrong way of thinking, the right ways of living and wrong ways of living. And those were always shared, and they continue to be shared by the elders so that hopefully our, our community is will will live resilient well-being members that we continue to share our food with the elderly with the disabled the with, with the widowed we always think of them those that can afford to buy gas at seven dollars a gallon to buy a boat at twelve thousand dollars to buy, buy outboard at twelve thousand dollars to buy shells and guns those are the only people that can go out and support the whole community. And today, there's no jobs in villages. The only jobs that we have are at the school and she's no um, DOI jobs, Department of Interior. I mean, um, uh, the road system. Other than that, what do the rest of the 800 people do? How do they survive? Unfortunately, with the force of the outside lifestyle, we are forced to lose a lot of our traditional roles. By that, I mean the men cannot, that don't have jobs, cannot afford to go buy $30,000 outfits, right? How can you do that? You can't. And if you have five kids under your belt, how can you survive? It's hard. It's a hard living out there. We just had two suicide young people. We're trying to protect our generation, our future generation. How do we do that? By talking together, by working together. Unfortunately, some of those people are forced to go to welfare system. They have no other choice, right? That's what people do, I mean, especially in cash economy. So in terms of improving, in terms of giving back their title as hunters, in terms of protecting, losing our language and losing our way of knowing, our way of living, we need a lot of help. We need to look at guidelines and policies that will help to improve the education, the workforce. I'm very lucky, unfortunately and fortunately, to have a job. But I'm forced to live out of the community because there's no jobs there. There's no jobs that reflect what I was trained for. So all my siblings that are, are graduated with doctorate degrees or, or graduate degrees, we can't live in the village. Because they're not designed for us yet, right? So we have to commute. We have to commute out of the village. We pay $1,000 to go to work. We go home five times a year to subsist, to attend rituals and ceremonies, to attend funerals. Alaska is really, really expensive place to stay. When I saw my ticket to come here from Anchorage for over $300, I said, 
that's not even going to bring me to the village from Anchorage. It, it, you know, um, we want to, we want to make our lives healthier for our, our future generation. The good thing is that some younger generations are thinking about higher education. That's a very good thing. We're getting more doctorates, um, native doctors in the system. That's a good thing. But we still need to support more education, funding resources for those that can't afford so that they can have ability to acquire degrees, right? And become scientists and become um, ecologists and become uh, educators, become literacy people, become linguists. There are potential, good potential bodies out there. But our job, our job is to collaborate so that we can figure ways to Im make improvements. You know, uh, how are we going to take care of all those thousand walrus right now? We don't know how. We can't form a ice for them. How are they going to survive this summer? I don't know. This is brand new, brand new as of two weeks ago. We've never dealt with thousand walrus on our island before. How are we going to protect them from dying? This is new science. But it's real, very real. And those little pup seals, they're dead, they're filling the river. What are they going to eat after a while? We can't feed them. We don't have zoos or we don't have a mechanism to feed them. They're lost. They're homeless. It's just like homeless humanity, but these are homeless marine mammal people. I mean, we call them people because in our perspective, they're beings, right? They're just not human, but they're beings, non-human beings. So these are all new things that are happening. But the dynamic part is that we have ability to start talking together. We have ability to start having a dialogue instead of segregating our offices this way and that way. We have to think in holistic perspective. We have to think as one web that cannot be separated as human, as land, as environment, as climate, as ecology. Because we're all affected somehow. We all impact the other. And there should be reciprocity of when some things happen that we all respond. We have responsibility to respond and do something to improve lives today because you know, we're living in modern life, right? And we have great opportunities to, um, to start collaborating, maybe improve our, our connections, our communications, our pathways, um, to make life more resilient in contemporary time. Thank you very much, Dr. John, for an amazing presentation and uh, appeal for uh, collaboration, communication, coordination, uh, holistic view, fantastic. I know that uh, lots of people are going to have questions for discussion. Um, feel free to uh, type them in the chat panel if you are uh, uh, online or anybody in the room have any questions, just raise your hand. And when you do have a question, please uh, press the button on your microphone so that people online can hear you. Do you have a question? Okay, so go ahead and press the button and say who you are as well. Hi, my name is Haley McKee. I'm a communication specialist with Defenders of Wildlife. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Dr. John. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, wildlife and conservation biology in Alaska. And um, 
I was wondering if there are, I, I know that Alaska Natives are participating actively in um, uh, managing and protecting the species uh, that mm -hmm. are around them. And I just wanted to learn more about that um, and see if you had any thoughts on how um, both collaboration with mm. biologists who may be coming from the lower 48 can be improved and also how um, we can maybe get, you know, more uh, Alaska Native people um, involved in that. Mm, thank you for that question. Um, yes, um, I know some people even from my own community that are involved in federal wildlife um, programs of where uh, they can speak their local language and they can help to communicate with the local people, which is a good thing. Um, I know that also um, in in the Arctic North, um, there there's some um, collaborative effort between Alaska and Canada in terms of caribou herd um, in that region, which is a good thing. And um, also that um, uh, some of our native people are involved um, in other like state and federal um, organizations like with the, with the Department of uh, Fish and Game, they have fisheries groups and Department of Natural Resources, they have groups that are involved in uh, policy and in um, guidance um, in terms of the, those species. Um, I believe that uh, for people that um, are new to the state, I would encourage them to um, uh, conduct research prior to um, uh, developing a, a research uh, topic um, methodology and framework and to identify that Alaska is very, very big. So they have to identify which local um, uh, location they want to go to uh, because we have five different major ethnic groups in the state. There's Tlingit and Haida, there's Aleut, there's Yupik, Inupiaq, and Athabascan, all of which some of them are subdivided into 20 smaller groups for per se. And so linguistically, culturally, they're, they are very diverse. And so when you think about that, I would uh, advise them to develop a co-management design uh, of planning of where they uh, are inclusive of the local experts, local based knowledge system that is culturally relevant and appropriate uh, to them. Because even in our Yupik region, we have 60 villages in Southwest Alaska. That's a lot of space. And so uh, the, the scholars and uh, agency people need to uh, do conduct their research as well as um, understanding the fact that we have over 200 tribal groups in the state that they can work with. So that's a good resource center there as well. And we also have a Alaska Federation of Natives where all the tribes are represented. And there's an annual um, fall annual meeting where all the legislators like Murkowski and all the senators come to be part of that and our governor and our, our legislation as well. And so there are some opportunities that, um, that um, are there uh, that are willing, that are good prospective agencies to collaborate with. Does that answer your question? Thank you. So um, I have a question online here from Andrew Chater. He asks, uh, you made the point that a key to fight climate change is to blend different ways of knowing. A good number of scientists are reluctant to truly blend indigenous and traditional knowledge and Western science. How can this resistance be overcome? Um, thank you for that question. Um, we live in contemporary world now. And um, I, I believe that, you know, when we... Uh, enter into higher education, we learn many things about other cultures uh, and um, we learn about their different ways of, of framing and um, different ways of doing things. So when you think about uh, the fact that there is some resistance um, of some scholars um, that are willing to accept it, the factual things that are happening, um, some of which I um, gave exemplified earlier. But in, in this context, um, 
uh, of being able to um, go out of your box to indigenize and decolonize institutions. That's okay. I, I think you know great opportunities when we indigenize or decolonize a system. We're opening up new doors. We're opening up new methodologies, new language, new, new theoretical frameworks that are great potential for advancement in research and scholarship. And that I would, I would advise you to do is to step out of the box and help them, even if you can guide them to learn more, to understand more, to think outside of their small box. That, to me, is the greatest gift, the best practice of research anyone can learn. Like when I'm, I'm preparing myself to go to Europe, I buy these books of their language and uh, their culture, right? I have to know. I'm hungry, I want to go bathroom, right? <laughs> so how do I say that in their language? It's the same thing. Great opportunity for us to do that with indigenous uh, societies as well. Learn their language. Take some time to spend time in the community. Go and observe. Observation is a great way to learn. You know when we sit there in the ocean, and I spend about four weeks to eight weeks all summer in the boat, hoping that that halibut hit my rod, hoping that that king hit my net, hoping that that herring will come so I can have a bait. That way of developing communication is the best method. And think with the people. Don't think above the people. Think below them or at the same level. We make a mistake when we think above people. Top-down management is the wrong management. When you go into communities thinking like that, you're not going to be welcomed. You're going to be viewed as somebody that does not want to work, collaborate with them. So the best advice is to think with the people work within the community, work with the local people. Then when they see how you're practicing, how you're acting, how you're talking, then they'll want to work with you. Go ahead and go eat with them. Go taste their seal oil or their whale or their moose. They'll appreciate that. Or learn some of their local words or their stories. They'll appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I have a, a question from Katie Gavinis. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about how schools, especially at the K-12 level, might do better in terms of recognizing and bringing together different ways of knowing, collaborating, learning together? Thank you for that question. Um, that, that's my passion. Um, <clears throat> I, I know that, you know, uh, across the nation, since I serve on National Council on Indian Education, um, our efforts have been to um, uh, uh, develop a curriculum that is culturally responsive, culturally responsive at the local basis. Um, the students need to um, understand and become aware of their own language, their own culture. Uh, when they're taught, uh, context that is out of their cultural context, it doesn't sink into their mind. It comes in one air and it seeps out the other air and disappears down the river. Um, that happened to my generation. We were forced to learn English. We were forced to learn about curbs and farms. We had no concept of to imagine cows and stuff we've never seen before or heard before. So coming from that angle, I know what it's like. You forget everything once you close the door. What's important is what is real at home. 
what is real at home is science of cutting the, 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 the marine mammal or, or salmon, for one thing. And understanding the edible parts, what's good for the body, mind, and soul of a human being. That's what's relevant. What's relevant is knowing how to build a kayak or a floatable boat that is waterproof with skins. That is important and that is local based, right? What is important is the language that my grandmothers use, my parents use. That is relevant to the child. That's what the child should be hearing. Fortunately, in state of Alaska, um, we have developed Alaska standards that are culturally based. And uh, even though um, it has been implemented, I don't think there's been some funding to implement them into the classrooms yet. Or maybe there has not been uh, funding to train the teachers yet how to use those culturally responsive curricula. And, and they're, they're in different dis discipline areas, K to 12, I believe. I was involved in that process a while back. But that's, those are the kind of steps that need to happen. Um, they need to make the, the, the um, curriculum so that it's local-based. Children understand them. They, they process them in their mind, and they can go practice them. Cultural practice is good. Take the kids out camping. Take the kids out in the boat or go hunting with them and give them credit for that. My nephew failed the class because he was needed to hunt out in the ocean. His father needed his help. If the school was designed to give him credit, he would have graduated in time. But unfortunately, the, the system was not set up yet. So without, those are the ways to um, implement culturally responsive curriculum into the classroom K-12. Um, yes, there needs to be uh, money Funding for more native teachers that are local based, that speak the language, that understand the culture, and also they need to hire um, teacher aides that can help the teachers with the language instruction, teaching and training, and also um, uh, practical stuff, hands-on activities. Uh, for the students. I know in Bethel region we have a charter school, Leipunlit Narvik, that um, has started that kind of process, and the children are graduating with the highest um, GPAs now that have gone through the immersion school uh, from high school, and I know some of them have become medical doctors, so that's a good thing. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, it's great. Um, yes, Martin. Dr. John, thank you very much. Mm. Um, I'm Martin Jeffries. I'm with the Office of Naval Research mm. here in Washington, DC. Hi. I lived in Alaska for a little over 21 years. I left in 2006, came to Washington, DC. I've been mm. here ever since. And um, I lived in Fairbanks, and I was a member of faculty at the university. Oh, maybe and I, I still have that. friends and colleagues who, um, some of them are engaged in co-production of knowledge with Alaska Native colleagues. Um, I wonder, could you comment on what you think the university itself, either the University of Alaska Fairbanks campus or maybe the statewide system, could do to help institutionalize more the co-production of knowledge approach or even the um, co-learning, if you will? Thank you very much, and um, I'm glad you were there. Maybe I was with you on campus. But anyhow, um, yeah, I, I I must say that right now um, there's there are some organizations like we have Alaska Native Studies statewide conferences now um, that are designed um, sponsored by the very few maybe what is it two to five percent of the faculty is Alaska Native and um, statewide. So for one thing, they need to increase um, the, the, the native hires. And we are getting more doctors um, that are qualified to teach at the graduate level. Um, my department, Center for Cross-Cultural Studies, uh, has a, a research center called Alaska Native Knowledge Network. And you can access research work for free online. 
So that's an agency that has been in place for the last 20 years, I think, 15, 20 years now, that has um, made, uh, that has produced research that is indigenous based, uh, from science to education to social science. So there are some resources available in that manner. And right now, um, that Alaska Native Studies Conference conducts annual um, conferences in three, three university bases, Fairbanks, Anchorage, and Southeast, of where we um, uh, request for um, conference presentations um, that present and demonstrate uh, cultural-based uh, work, either at undergraduate level or graduate level. And so my thinking, uh, based on your question, is that um, there are already some potential organizations that can help to um, indigenize um, the curricula. Um, I, I know that um, um, university is going through a lot of budget cut right now. Um, I know that that, uh, that there is a, a big need for funding resource. We have uh, potential st students that are interested in our programs, in our graduate programs, um, that can help to uh, indigenize or, or, or make that process faster by um, uh, conducting research and helping with their research as well. Um, and um, I am excited to see that uh, the organization, Alaska Native Studies Network, also produces and publishes some of the work that has been presented uh, that will be useful. But generally, we need more Native teachers. We need more money to implement culturally responsive into our curricula. Um, I think there's great ideas out there and um, great potential. Uh, for for uh, different agencies to work together, like the scientists up, up on top can work with the linguists on the bottom. I mean, we talked about right, UAF, right? I, I, it's always seemed like science is way over there and then social science here. Um, so hopefully that, um, that, I don't have the real answers, but that's the idea that I have, that there are people that are qualified to work together. So I have a, a follow-up question of sorts uh, from uh, Diane Hirschberg at University of Alaska Anchorage. Uh, she asks, uh, um, she says, I'm really struck by your description of how our university system places huge burdens on our faculty colleagues who come from Alaska's indigenous communities. Uh, it's uh, far easier for me to go see my family in Los Angeles than to get out to Tuxuk Bay from uh, Anchorage. Uh, how might we reshape the university to better support indigenous faculty and the communities from where they come? Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I believe that, um, that the Native faculty can acquire more training of how they can um, acquire resources so that uh, travel can be less stringent, uh, that more research can be conducted with the local people in general, and um, I, I I, I firmly believe that, um, you know, the ecology, the environment is a great classroom space. And I think if we work together so that we design our classes so that um, we can take the classroom out into the, the environment, to the fish camps or, or to homes of the elders, for example, if they're collecting narratives, um, that would be a great opportunity uh, of how uh, the institutions can can sort of like step forward to help with scholarship in that way. Terrific. Well, I just want to also share with you, uh, Dr. John, that uh, we have a whole lot of people online who are saying things like Kuyana and oh. what an amazing presentation. And thank you so much for sharing from the heart. And, uh, and thank you for the passion and enthusiasm and dedication to this. Um, and so maybe uh, we can uh, join together in uh, thanking uh, Dr. John one more time for an amazing seminar. Oh, Guyana. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something.
Um, just some announcements of some quick upcoming activities. Uh, um, we will be having a uh, Arctic Research Community Networking Reception at Polar 2018 and encourage you to uh, come to that. Um, we have a number of other programs going on, including uh, uh, we're uh, co-sponsoring a uh, Perspectives of Women in Polar Research panel on June 20th with uh, the Interagency Arctic Research uh, Policy Committee. Um, and uh, have a number of sessions we're facilitating. Um, and then also the uh, recording of this seminar will be available online within about a week. So please uh, tell your friends and colleagues to uh, uh, tune in, take a look at the recording. And um, we are uh, always, of course, encouraging people to get involved with the community, to become a member. Thank you so much, Dr. John, for an amazing presentation. Thank you all for coming and hope that you have a great rest of your day.